Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, episode 43, Apollo 13, part 2, The Age of Aquarius. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like you to stir up your cryo tanks. Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main bus B undervolt. Two days, seven hours, and 54 minutes into the flight of Apollo 13, the crew were preparing for their rest period. Just a few minutes after ending a television broadcast, Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swaggart were about 200,000 miles away from home, with another 22 hours or so left before they would slip behind the moon and fire up the large service propulsion system engine to enter into lunar orbit. One of the last tasks to complete before going to bed was a set of housekeeping procedures, including a stir of the cryogenic tanks. Stirring the tanks involves exactly what you think it does. Inside of the service module were a number of different large tanks that supported the mission. Giant tanks full of hypergolic propellant for the service propulsion system, tanks full of helium to pressurize propellant systems, and tanks full of hydrogen and oxygen to both feed the fuel cells and provide water and breathing oxygen to the crew. When command module pilot Jack Swaggart flipped the switch to stir the cryo tanks, he activated small fans inside the pressurized oxygen tanks. These fans kept the slush-like, super-cold, super-pressurized oxygen from going completely solid, which would prevent the fuel cells from working properly. Stirring the tanks was completely routine and completely benign. So it must have come as quite a shock to the crew when two minutes later, something in the rear of the spacecraft exploded. The crisis began with a large bang, a brief loss of telemetry, a computer reboot, and a lot of activity from the RCS thrusters. The crew immediately noted a number of systems that were off nominal or actively failing. Main bus B, one of the three critical paths for electricity to power the spacecraft, was showing low voltage. Main bus A followed shortly afterwards. Oxygen tank 2 was showing off scale high, and then zero. Fuel cells 1 and 3, two of the three devices that generated electricity using hydrogen and oxygen, had failed. Each indicated that it had no oxygen flow. Mission rules dictated that at least two fuel cells be operational in order to attempt a lunar landing. Unless something could be done quickly, Apollo 13 would not be landing on the moon. The crew frantically set to work trying to ascertain just what ailment had befallen their spacecraft. Mission Control called up readings and made recommendations, struggling through the suddenly low-quality voice signal. The first order of business was to start powering down parts of the command module Odyssey in order to accommodate the new lower level of power coming from the fuel cells. About 14 minutes after the mysterious bang, Jim Lovell called down, It looks to me, looking out the hatch, that we are venting something. We are venting something out into space. At this point, Oxygen Tank 2 was pegged at zero quantity, and the needle for Oxygen Tank 1 was visibly moving lower and lower. The Odyssey was dying. Just over half an hour after the accident began to unfold, Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes radioed down about the current configuration of the spacecraft. As you'll recall, the command module connects to the Lunar Module via a docking probe, which is then removed from the docking tunnel. Since the crew had just been giving America a televised tour of the spacecraft, Hayes wanted the ground to be aware that the docking tunnel hatch was in place, but the probe was inside the command module instead of the tunnel. He said, we're going to stay in this situation until you kind of give us an okay to reinstall the probe and drogue, or if necessary, to use the LEM consumables. This was the first mention, at least over the airwaves, of the possibility of using the lunar module Aquarius as a lifeboat. Soon, though, it became apparent that this was the only possible move. The lifeblood of the command module was spewing out into space, and it would only be able to support life for a limited time. An hour and a half after the explosion, Fred Hayes and Jim Lovell began to power up the LEM. Only minutes of power remained in the Odyssey. Of critical importance was getting the LEM guidance system online and transferring the guidance parameters from Odyssey to Aquarius. Without that transfer of information, the LEM would be flying blind and would require a platform alignment. Given all the debris floating around, there was no guarantee that would be possible, since stars and distant debris look pretty similar through a sextant. 
Two hours after the explosion, the Lem was ready to serve as a lifeboat, and fuel cell number two was shut down, cutting off all electricity from the service module for the rest of the mission. Next, Swaggart shut down the entire command module. Staring at the darkened control panels must have been an eerie feeling. An Apollo command module had never been shut down completely in space before, but doing so was the only chance of survival. At this point in the mission, one of the options for an abort was to fire the large SPS engine on the back of the service module and simply turn around and come back to Earth. This was possible since the spacecraft was near the equigravisphere, the point where the pull of gravity from the Earth is similar to that of the Moon. The spacecraft slowed to only a few thousand miles per hour at this point, which is actually quite slow compared to the blistering speeds encountered immediately after translunar injection. You can think of this like rolling a bowling ball up a large hill. As it crests the hill, it's going to be going pretty slowly, so it wouldn't take that much of a nudge to push it back down the Earth side of the hill. Unfortunately, with the service module first in an unknown and potentially unsafe state, and then shut down entirely, the SPS was not an option. From here on out, the mission would have to rely on the small engines on board the lunar module Aquarius. With the immediate crisis under control, the mission entered a new phase. The first task was to get back on a free return trajectory. As you'll recall, starting on Apollo 12, the outbound trip to the moon took a path that would pass within several hundred miles of the moon and then miss the Earth by tens of thousands of miles. With the moon looming large in the window, a maneuver to correct that error was required soon. I'm sure whoever suggested trying out the LEM engine while docked on Apollo 9 was glad they had done so, since Apollo 13 could now use this configuration without concern. Four and a half hours after the incident began, the LEM descent propulsion system was fired up at 10% thrust for 5 seconds, and then another 30 seconds at 40% thrust, returning the mission to a free return trajectory. With that critical maneuver out of the way, the LEM-2 was powered down as much as was practical. Consumables were the name of the game for this mission. Assuming no further changes were made to their trajectory, Apollo 13 had nearly 100 hours between losing the service module and splashing down in the ocean. The command module would have enough supplies for a few hours once it was reactivated, if it could be reactivated, but most of that time would have to be supported by the LEM. The lunar module was designed to support two guys for about 34 hours. Now it needed to support three guys for 100 hours. Contrary to what you might think, oxygen was actually not a big problem. It turns out that it doesn't really take much oxygen to keep a person alive. Most of the oxygen in the service module was there to feed fuel cells, not human lungs. Since the LEM doesn't have fuel cells, you might be wondering why it had so much oxygen on board. The answer is that when the cabin is depressurized before the crew climbs out to walk on the lunar surface, that oxygen is just vented out into space so they needed to bring enough to refill the entire cabin twice. The biggest concerns were water, electricity, and carbon dioxide. There was actually plenty of drinkable water on board. In fact, despite being powered down, the crew would continue to get their drinking water from the command module since the potable water system was pressurized. They just had to pull a tap, at least until it froze near the end of the mission. But again, the concern wasn't really human thirst, but rather the thirsty machines on board. In order to keep systems from overheating, water was run through heat exchangers throughout the spacecraft before being sublimated out into space, taking the heat with it. No water, no cooling. No cooling, no machines. No machines? Well, let's not worry about that. Electricity was the next big concern. The LEM was designed to operate for a relatively brief window, so it was powered by batteries, which of course only have a finite amount of power. Even when in the mostly powered down state on the way out to the moon, the LEM consumed something like 900 watts of power. This is one of those facts I didn't have time to track down, so take it for what it is, but I believe that under normal circumstances, that power would be provided by the CSM via an electrical umbilical run through the docking tunnel. But with the CSM powered down, the LEM was on its own for the next few days. In order to make it home, the LEM systems would have to be powered down as much as was possible, with even the guidance platform and computer being taken down for long stretches of time. 
A nice side effect of this was it meant that less water was required for cooling. Lastly, CO2. The astronauts were swimming in oxygen, but they were also generating carbon dioxide. It takes a surprisingly small amount of CO2 to kill someone, so manned spacecraft need a system to scrub it out of the air on board. On Apollo, this was accomplished with canisters full of lithium hydroxide, which would capture the CO2 out of the air. The LEM had a couple of these canisters, which would actually last most of the trip, but they'd eventually need to switch over to the canisters from the command module. The only problem was, well, we'll get to that in a little bit. These three resources would need to be carefully managed over the remaining length of the mission if Lovell, Hayes, and Swaggart were to return home safely. One way to make this challenge a little easier would be to reduce the duration of the mission. With that in mind, a burn was planned to speed things up a bit. This was called the Parasynthian Plus Two Burn, since it would take place two hours after the closest approach to the moon. Just a quick side note, the general term for the lowest point in an orbit is periapsis, but just to be complicated, each celestial body gets its own version. On Earth, it's perigee. On Jupiter, it's perijove. On the moon, I think the more typical term these days is perilune, but back in the day, it was apparently parasynthian. So, parasynthian plus two burn. Anyway, by doing a prograde burn, that is firing the engines in the direction of the Earth, for about four minutes, they could add nearly 600 miles per hour to their velocity, shaving nine hours off of the return leg. An interesting wrinkle I hadn't heard until doing research for this episode was that there was another option that could have shaved an entire further 24 hours off of the mission length. Keep in mind that since the service module had not been called upon to enter or depart lunar orbit, it was still full of propellant, making it pretty heavy. If the service module were to be jettisoned while passing the moon, then the comparatively small LEM engine would be able to impart a lot more velocity. Less mass, more speed. The move was shot down, though, since it looked like they should be able to have enough consumables for this new 142-hour mission duration option, though it would be close. There was also concern about how the heat shield would respond to being exposed to space and an unusual amount of cold for 40 hours. I found this decision pretty interesting, since the next time we'll be talking about a major accident in spaceflight, a long soak in unexpectedly cold temperatures will also play a role. On April 14th at 6.21pm Houston time, Apollo 13 passed within 158 miles of the moon. It was the closest it would get. However, an hour later, the S-4B impacted the lunar surface only 74 miles away from the Apollo 12 seismometer. It was the only part of Apollo 13 to reach the moon. An hour after that, Apollo 13 completed the Parasynthian Plus 2 burn, and the crew powered down the LEM as much as possible. Now it was a waiting game. Life on board Apollo 13 was a strange combination of heightened tension, extreme boredom, and endurance. With most systems powered down to save electricity, there wasn't all that much to do. Mission control was nothing but frantic activity as procedures were planned, prototypes built, and trajectories calculated, but the crew mostly just had to wait. They slept in shifts, making sure that at least one crew member was awake at all times. At first, they would float back up to the now dark and quiet command module to sleep, though as the mission progressed, they tried to avoid the command module as much as possible, since it slowly dropped in temperature, eventually reaching as low as 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Try sleeping in that. As the temperature dropped, condensation built up on all surfaces, obscuring the windows and making everything damp to the touch. Communications were tough since the high-gain antenna was powered down to save electricity, leaving only the scratchy omnidirectional antenna. Additionally, there were only two headsets in the LEM, always leaving one crew member out of the loop. Usually only one person would wear the headset and handle communications with the ground. The crew stayed optimistic and focused, but as the mission progressed and the combination of sleep deprivation and cold sunk in, nerves began to get frayed. There was never an outburst as depicted in the Ron Howard film, but it was not a comfortable flight. That was especially true for Fred Hayes, who was suffering from a painful urinary tract infection brought on by the cold conditions. Things never go quite as planned in spaceflight, as we have clearly learned, 
but this especially applies to the trajectory of the vehicle. Whenever you execute a maneuver, there's always going to be a little bit of error. You can try to predict, but it's always going to be a little bit off. Maybe the engine went a few hundredths of a second too long, or was pointing a tenth of a degree off the ideal vector. For this reason, small mid-course corrections were required. This is normally no big deal, but like most of Apollo 13, things were a little bit different. After the Odyssey and Aquarius looped around the moon and performed the Parasynthian plus two burn, it became clear that while their trajectory was within safe limits, it was coming in a little shallow. Mission controllers would feel better if they blipped the LEM descent engine a bit to ensure that there would be no nasty surprises later in the flight. They also wanted to get it done sooner rather than later, thanks to the still rising helium pressure in the descent propulsion system engine. Hey, remember when the helium pressure was the big concern on this flight? The issue still posed no risk to the crew, but once the pressure rose high enough, a pressure relief disc would rupture and the DPS would be out of commission. Making this especially tricky, the crew had to do the burn without powering up all the usual LEM systems, including the PINGs, the primary guidance and navigation system. Strictly speaking, you don't need the guidance computer when doing a burn, you just needed a way to be sure which way your vehicle was pointed. As usual with NASA, someone had thought about this ahead of time and made a plan. The plan was to align the terminator of the Earth, that's the line where the day meets the night, with the crewman optical alignment site in the LEM window. They knew that if they could keep the Terminator aligned horizontally and keep the sun off at a specific angle, they would be pointed in the right direction. The maneuver was a little unusual, but the theory had been tested by an astronaut on a previous flight. One Jim Lovell on Apollo 8. Perfect. To help keep things under control, the less resource-intensive abort guidance system was powered up and placed in attitude hold mode. The computer would control yaw, keeping the window facing the Earth. Lovell would control roll, which dictated the apparent angle of the terminator, and Hayes controlled pitch, which kept the Earth and the sun in the right part of the window. During the 14-second maneuver, Swaggart would keep count on a wristwatch. Why they didn't just control all three axes with the attitude hold mode, I'm not really sure, but maybe because it's more dramatic this way. 105 hours and 18 minutes into the flight, the LEM engine was fired up at 10% throttle. Swaggart began counting down, and Lovell, Hayes, and the AGs kept the whole stack pointed in the right direction. 14 seconds later, the engine was shut down, and that was that. Not something you'd want to do every flight, but nothing overly dramatic. More concerning than the infamous manual burn was the level of carbon dioxide in the cabin environment. Since the LEM wasn't intended to support so many people for so long, measures would have to be taken to ensure that the CO2 level didn't rise too high. If it did, the crew would find their vision getting fuzzy, their minds losing their edge, and their bodies becoming increasingly fatigued until they eventually faded off to sleep forever. Not nice. Right off the bat, the challenge was made a little easier when the flight surgeon allowed a doubling of the usual CO2 levels. The existing limits were set to be a little conservative, and given the emergency circumstances, the higher levels should be perfectly safe, if not ideal. Even with that allowance, the LEM still did not have enough lithium hydroxide canisters to make the trip. Something would have to be done. Enter the mailbox. Now, I feel like most people who know anything at all about Apollo 13 know about the jury-rigged device that came to be known as the mailbox. And to be honest, I actually think it's a pretty straightforward story with no real surprises, but it's also just too much fun not to tell again. Both the command module and the lunar module used a similar type of lithium hydroxide canister, so one type should work in the other system. It was just one problem. The canisters on the LEM were round, and the canisters on the command module were square. I think part of why this story is so popular is there's something pretty funny about some guys riding along in the pinnacle of human technology while trying to figure out how to fit a square peg in a round hole. While the crew worked on other issues, engineers on the ground started figuring out how to do it. By using a manifest of the items on board the spacecraft, they were able to rummage around and try different things out to see what might work. The scene is portrayed memorably in the Ron Howard film, which is probably why it's so well known. In the end, the solution was actually not all that tricky. Here it is. 
First, take two command module canisters and tape them together, end to end. This basically just makes a taller canister. Next, take the cover off of one of the manuals on board and tape it to one end of the canister, forming an arch. Then, take a plastic bag and tape it around the end of the canister with the manual cover, allowing the stiff paper of the cover to hold its arch, keeping the bag away from the canister. Lastly, take one of those spacesuit hoses and tape the end of the bag to it. Hook the suit hose up to the CO2 system, and you're good to go. The mailbox was simple, effective, and played a key role in keeping the crew alive. As the Earth began to grow ever larger in the LEMS windows, and with only about five hours until entry interface, the crew jettisoned the service module. For the first and only time in the Apollo program, the command module and lunar module flew on their own. As the service module drifted away, the crew gathered around the windows with cameras at the ready, hoping to get an idea of what the heck had happened to their spacecraft. What they saw shocked everyone. An entire panel of the vehicle was missing completely, top to bottom. The inner guts of the module were exposed, leaving tangles of wires hanging out into space. Oxygen Tank 2 was missing completely. Upon closer inspection, one horn of the high-gain antenna was damaged, presumably by the departing bay panel, which explained the initial drop of telemetry. A scuff mark on the SPS engine bell confirmed that they were wise to avoid using the suspect engine. The damage extended all the way up to where the command module heat shield normally was, raising questions about the integrity of the critical component. Looking at the damage wrought on the service module, it's incredible that they made it this far. The last and most crucial phase of the mission was soon approaching, turning the command module on again. This was a delicate process. By carefully rationing their electricity, the LEM was able to very slowly recharge the batteries in the command module, taking up to 18 hours for some batteries. The startup procedure was worked out on the ground by engineers and tested in the simulator by fellow astronauts. It was vitally important that they not blow the electricity budget or cause any power surges. The procedure itself took over an hour to read up to an increasingly weary crew, and when the time came to execute it, the sleep-deprived men had to exercise extreme care since a single out-of-place step could doom the whole mission. Margins were just too tight. The fact that the sequence of steps was unlike anything that had been practiced in the years and months of training preceding the mission didn't help. By the time the startup procedure began, the command module had been almost completely inert for about 80 hours, other than a few brief partial power-ups to get a glimpse into the system state via telemetry. The components were cold, and in some cases covered in condensation. They hadn't been designed for this, and there was no guarantee that any of it would work. But with just two and a half hours before entry, the crew finished the ad hoc procedure, and Odyssey was alive again. Its job complete, the LEM was jettisoned with just over an hour remaining to re-entry. Lovell said, Farewell, Aquarius, and we thank you. At this point, all that could be done had been done. All that was left to do was wait. Odyssey slipped into the Earth's upper atmosphere, and a burning plasma sheath engulfed it, cutting off all communications. Around the world, people were transfixed by their televisions, waiting to learn the outcome. Thirteen countries, including the Soviet Union, had offered their navies in support of recovery. Eighty countries had vowed to keep the radio airwaves clear near the Apollo frequencies so as not to interfere. The world watched. The expected contact time came and went with nothing. But nearly a minute and a half after NASA expected to hear from them, telemetry started streaming down again. Capcom Joe Kerwin called up, Odyssey Houston standing by, over, and Jack Swaggart responded simply, Okay, Joe. <laughs> Not quite as dramatic as in the movie, but I suppose these things rarely are. Five days, 22 hours, 54 minutes, and 44 seconds after lifting off, Apollo 13 splashed down safely in the Pacific Ocean. As the world celebrated, the three men were recovered, placed on the aircraft carrier USS Iwo Jima, and whisked away for a medical checkup. They had made it. So, what happened? To answer that, we have to go back a few weeks, 
Before the flight, engineers had trouble draining oxygen tank 2 after a test. Getting creative, they had turned the heater on to warm up the oxygen and force it out. This could theoretically damage the tank, but there was a thermostat on board that would stop the heater if it got above the maximum safe temperature. Plus, an engineer watched a dial that indicated the tank's temperature so he could verify everything was fine. But everything was not fine. Building a spaceship is not an easy task. It involves a lot of design work, a lot of changes, and a lot of configuration management. The Apollo vehicle's electrical system runs at 28 volts, but somewhere along the way the decision was made to have ground-side test equipment run at 65 volts. Okay, no problem. Memos went out, manufacturers made the requisite changes, and gave their subcontractors a heads up. Oxygen Tank 2 was no different. Except somewhere along the way, someone missed the new requirements and the thermostat switch in the tank was never updated. It's just one of those things. So, when engineers turned on the heater to boil off the oxygen and the temperature began to rise, the thermostat tried to kill the power to the heater. But with the higher than expected voltage, it just welded itself shut. The tank was unable to stop the heater, and the temperature continued to rise and rise and rise. Instead of the maximum of 80 degrees, it is thought that the temperature hit as high as 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. The extreme heat damaged the insulation around the wiring inside the tank, setting the stage for disaster. But, I can hear you wondering, why didn't the guy watching the test notice that the tank had hit a thousand degrees? It turns out that his temperature readout only went up to 80 degrees, since that was the maximum expected temperature. There was no way to tell the difference between 80 degrees and more than 80 degrees. Yet another example of how important it is to have visibility into an opaque system. Remember, kiddies, always make sure your diagnostic data can exceed what's expected. Fast forward to the fateful cryostir, and with electricity coursing through the damaged wires, a spark formed, because of course it did. In the pressurized pure oxygen environment, the spark started a fire, burning the remaining Teflon insulation and basically anything else burnable inside the tank. This didn't cause an immediate explosion, however. These tanks are pretty tough. Reviewing the telemetry later, big swings in pressure could be observed as the tank fire grew. Inevitably, though, it was too much, and about two minutes later, the tank blew. The tank did not explode like a bomb, their design not to do that. Instead, something near the neck of the tank failed, and the entire contents whooshed out into the service module bay basically instantly. Based on telemetry, it seems likely that this started a number of other fires in the equipment bay. But not for long, because in less than a second the entire bay panel popped off, wanged the high-gain antenna, and went tumbling off into space. The shock of the whole event slammed shut valves leading to two of the fuel cells and one of the RCS quads. And the whole sequence of events damaged the plumbing surrounding the oxygen tanks, leading to Oxygen Tank 1's two-hour long death. The fuel cells ran for a couple more minutes, surviving on the oxygen already in the lines, but when that was exhausted, they failed completely. Two fuel cells were down, half the oxygen was gone entirely, and the other half was rapidly dwindling. And the rest was history. It was actually incredibly lucky that the explosion happened when it did. Had it happened after arriving in lunar orbit, the crew would have died. There was no way to get out of lunar orbit without the SPS. Had it happened on the return leg when the LEM had been discarded, the crew would have died. No lifeboat. And while maybe Houston could have gotten creative with the consumables or the trajectory, I think even if it had happened earlier in the mission, the crew likely would have died. There wasn't much water and electricity left at the end of the mission. I'm not sure they could have made it stretch for another day. The mission was hailed as a successful failure. It was the first aborted mission in the Apollo program, and the crew did not reach the lunar surface. But, against incredible odds, the crew returned safely to Earth. The accident was sort of a shot across the bow for NASA, a reminder that no matter how much experience you have with this stuff, it never gets easy. Spaceflight will never tolerate carelessness, incapacity, and neglect, and failure is always an option. Next time, 
NASA fixed what needed to be fixed and got back to flying. Apollo 14 was ready to fly, and after nearly 10 years on the bench, so was Alan Shepard. Despite the fixes, I'm sure that the crew would keep an extra close eye on their oxygen tanks as they made their way to their lunar destination. Perhaps you've heard of it, the Fra Mauro Highlands. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. Thank you.